Bill, Mary Beth, Judge Nikos. Oh yes, and also just so you know, the meeting is being recorded. Um, and if that little thing didn't just pop up on your screen. So once again, Bojo, Mary Beth, Judge Nikos, National Bakeway, Chicana. My name is Mary Beth Yeager, and I am a citizen of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and Chicana. And I am also a research analyst at the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. However, I'm coming from you today from the uh, homelands of the Duwamish, Nahomish, and Puget Salish peoples. I telecommute, I've been telecommuting um, for several years now to the University of Arizona. And um, like I said, I work at, for the Native Nations Institute there. And I'm also part of the Indigenous Foods and Knowledges Network. I'm a co-lead for it. And that is a uh, four-year NSF, um, National Science Foundation funded research coordination network that is bringing together indigenous peoples from the US Southwest and um, Arctic regions. And we usually do um, in, in person meetings. However, due to COVID 19, we are not obviously going to be doing any person meetings right now. Actually, our next meeting was going to be at the Hopi Nation. And before all of this started, uh, COVID 19 took off and got super serious, um, we had started. Of planning the this webinar series and so we've been hearing from various people um we heard earlier about inuit in january inuit food security project um, about the indigenous foods knowledges network from two of the members and then today we're hearing from um terry hohoney and michael johnson about hopi food sovereignty through farming and collaborations and so i'm going to read a quick bio about both of them and thank you so much um for both of you for being here today um, and I really appreciate it. And um, I don't know, thank you all who have been, who are here signed up for our um, webinar. So Terry Hohoni is Hopi and Tewa, is from the Tobacco Clan from the village of Tewa on the Hopi Reservation. She has her bachelor's degree of science and exercise and wellness health promotions from Arizona State University. Currently she is the program manager for the Natwani Coalition, a project of the Hopi Foundation. Michael Kotawa Johnson, who's Hopi, is a research associate for the Native American Agriculture Fund and holds a PhD in natural resources from the University of Arizona. He is Hopi farmer who continues agriculture and conservation techniques that predates Western science by well over two millennia. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Terry to start um, the presentations. Good morning, the Terry Hanani and Bahan Matua, the Bibwongwa, the Tewa Ankh. My name's Terry Hanani um, from the village of Tewa and I'm Tobacco Clan, and I am the program manager for the Natwani Coalition. So I'll, um, my presentation today is just briefly on the things that we do um, out here on Hopi. Um, around uh, food sovereignty. So uh, I'll be sharing my screen. And can you all hear me? Okay. So yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so uh, I am with the uh, Not Winnie Coalition, which is a project of the Hopi Foundation. And um, we are one of many projects of the Hopi Foundation, which is one of the longest running uh, nonprofit organizations out here on Hopi. Uh, so as you can see, our sister programs here, um, the Barbara Chester Award Hoi, which is Hopi Opportunity Youth Initiative, Hopi Substance Abuse Prevention Center, uh, KUII, Hopi Radio Station, the Hopi Leadership Program, and the Hopi Youth Leadership Program, and Hopi VITA Partnership, and then us, Not Winning Coalition. So um, we are under the umbrella of the Hopi Foundation, which is our, our mother, basically. Um, this is a picture of our uh, some of our staff and uh, some of our board. Uh, we have an overarching board. Uh, so right there are listed the um, board of trustees and then our um, staff picture. 
So for myself, with um, my program, I am a staff of three. So, uh, let's see. So there's myself, the uh, program manager, and I have my program associate, who is Kyle Nithimya Duawungwa uh, from the village of Hopella, and uh, Sienna Sekiva, our program coordinator, who is Duawungwa from the village of Sichomobi. All right, so uh, we do have a CAB. So uh, that's our community advisory board. These are voluntary um, volunteers who help us to um, basically give us the um, traditional knowledge that we need in order to um, guide our program. And um, so we have our senior CAB members, which are um, elders in, uh, and older adults. Then we have our youth cab members who are um, who are um, young adults. So we have uh, seven active members right now. So they um, basically, when we fly too high to the sky, they bring us back down. With you know, when our our ideas get too um, out of our um, um, that don't align with our initiatives, they kind of bring us back in and 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 ground us in the things that we do. So our uh, mission, our vision actually from the Not Winning Coalition is to preserve and strengthen the healthy food system and agriculture traditions of the Hopi and Tewith people. So we do this in several different ways. Uh, we are a island within an island. So if you know anything about um, the Navajo Nation, they encompass the whole four corner region of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. And we are a island within their island, if you can see that. Um, so we have 12 villages, uh, all in rural areas between east and west. Uh, so how we uh, try to engage with our communities and, and as you know, any rural community, trying to get the word of mouth out there, we do that uh, via flyers, social media, our website, um, our local newspaper, Hopi Tutuvini, uh, our radio station, which is our sister program, KYI, and just word of mouth and email blast. So we, we try to be um, savvy about how we um, provide outreach to our communities. So one of our programs that we have here are, is a community grant program. We were granted, uh, we we're in, uh, a grantee, one of the fast track um, grantees for the uh, Native American Agriculture Fund. So um, with those funds, we were able to do a community grant program, which in turn just re-granted um, some of that um, monies to our, our people out here in Hopi. So we created two separate community grants, the micro grant program, and then the partnership capacity building grant. So you can see the um, dollars amount that are available um, per year. So we're in our second and final year of this um, um, community grant program. So we have them broken up into three cycles, which just basically means three opportunities to apply. So um, it, you don't, the, the people don't have to do these particular activities. They can do whatever activity of their choosing um, that they want to do for that will increase our food system our, or or um, continue our um, agricultural tra traditions out here. So it's broken up into three cycles, uh, January, then March, then May, but each cycle ends in September. So if you're lucky, you get, got granted cycle one, you just have a longer period of time to do your project and, and so on um, for cycle two and cycle three. So they're all required to have a final project report, uh, basically like a book report form to us. Uh, we understand like um, farmers and gardeners aren't, you know, um, their their job is to be in the fields and everything like that. So we try not to make it so difficult to where they're having to write us a detailed report. We just want like a broad like book report format um, with pictures and stuff so that we can show um, showcase them which is a mandatory grantee showcase that we're hoping to have in October. Um, so it's just uh, like a networking opportunity. We have it set up as a like a type of um, 
science fair exhibit. So each grantee, uh, last year we had 40 grantees and they just all put up a, a trifold board and showed each other what they did. And this was a great opportunity to network between each village and each person you know, maybe somebody was um, growing chickens or sheep or did a bakey house or some other thing. It was just an opportunity for them to network with one another um, with their different projects. So these are just some examples, just some examples. So like I said, we had 40 grantees last year. Um, we have another um, 20 this year. I just finished cycle two. We grant. Um, we uh, awarded 10 more <clears throat> grantees um, for cycle two this year. So these are just some example projects of what people are, are doing. Um, starting um, with projects that try to involve our, our youth because um, they're not so um, interested in farming anymore. So, uh, or doing spring restorations, um, cleaning up the springs. Uh, so th there's a lot of weeds growing, which does um, suck up a lot of the water or even just uh, repairing their farm, uh, their tractor implements or, you know, um, repairing their trailer beds. And with these little bit of funds, they're able to do all these um, things that can continue their um, farming and growing. So here's just some more examples of grantees that got um, funded. Uh, Marshall Masayas, we try to like, encourage uh, innovative practices, but as you know, in innovative, sustainable practices, which um, can go go towards their growing. So he got um, he's one of the many people who started doing rainwater harvesting out here. So he um, used that to um, get tanks and a rainwater collection system, and you know, people out here, you know, with the younger generation, it's encouraging them to actually make that step forward for themselves. So they're getting um, encouraged and um, taking that step on for themselves. So this is from point zero to having a field, you know, so uh, they're able to clear a field of their own with the tools that they purchase with the grant funds. Uh, villages have are have an opportunity to apply to as well. So um, I'm gonna sh uh, play a short video. It's like a minute long. So this is just uh, what the village of Bakavi did for. Um, they did vermicomposting, which is very uh, different. Um, so if you don't know anything about uh, vermicomposting, it's um, uh, composting by worms. Oops. Did I go back? Man, sorry, I was trying to get the previous slide. Try if you have arrows on your keyboard, try the button. Got it? Easy? So they bought um, seed starts and um, heating pads, and this is their worm composting system. like a little one minute video of what we um, you know were able to capture from their work. Village of Tewa was another um, recipient. Uh, so this gives them the bigger grant partnership grant gives them an opportunity to uh, actually employ summer workers and um, you know do more capacity building um, with their with those grant funds. So this is uh, was a larger scale project. And uh, Hopi Farm Crew, another recipient. Um, so they were able to fund, you know, a summer work crew, which um, they grew their own food for their work crews. And, um, you know, so they produced a lot of food, which was amazing. And they were able to um, feed their um, farm crews and learn how to do um, preservation methods like drying and canning foods. 
Um, so we do offer technical assistant workshops, um, things like vermicomposting, canning, tree pruning, and then we're um, doing more in 2020. We're hoping to do more in 2020, um, like fencing and um, um, pest management and stuff like that. So um, oh, I'll just skip this video because uh, I know Michael's itching to go. <laughs> um, so. Um, we are born, the um, Not Winning Coalition was born out of the Hopi Community Food Assessment, which was done in uh, 2004. So uh, it was a Hopi reservation-wide uh, food assessment, just um, getting more data on how, how many people were doing traditional farming and where were they buying their food from? Was it local grocery stores or were they going off reservation? Were they... Um, um, doing backyard gardening, stuff like that. So all of the data that came forward um, helped to shape our coalition, the Not Winnie Coalition, uh, and to create our initiatives, our projects that we do now. So um, we're, we're that is important. I'm sure that all of you know that. So it gives you a foundation to build upon and gives you um, scientific backup that you need to do when you're going towards um, you know, trying to apply for grants or trying to find funding to um, support projects that will um, will um, help your food system in your community. So, uh, out of born out of the food assessment, they uh, wanted more um, hands-on things, uh, more talking sessions. So, one of the pro uh, initiatives was the biennial Hopi Agriculture and Food Symposium. So, we just had one last year in 2019. So. It'll happen again in 2021. So we, uh, it's kind of our, our agricultural cycle is a cyclical cycle. So every single month where there's certain things that you do out here and hopefully to prepare your fields or, or plant or, you know, um, everything is kind of just based off of our, our, our farming. Um, so this is um, what we did in 2019. Um, we put together, uh, different sessions with um, local um, knowledge keepers here out here in Hopi and to talk to um, local Hopis who want to learn more. And um, we, another initiative we have is a historical Hopi agricultural photo exhibit. So there, these are uh, rare photographs that uh, were done by, uh, that were collected by my predecessors um, in um, the 2000s. So, they went around to um, private collectors, museums, and universities and collected a lot of these um, historical photos. So we have this available to rent to um, anybody who wants to rent our photos to put on exhibit. We have the Hopi Not Winning for Youth Project, which is another initiative. And uh, like I said, our um, this is the Hopi Agricultural Cycle Calendar. That, um, we have different calendars out here. Um, so our our ceremonial calendar is different, but it's also kind of intertwined with it because all the ceremonies that we do out here are to pray and call for rain so that they can come rain our um, rain on our, our our fields and stuff. So um, they are separate, but they're kind of intertwined at the same time. So um, there's different. Um, names for the month according to if you're referring to the agricultural things that you're doing that month or whether you're um, doing ceremonial things that month so um then it has the different ears of corn which is our our main um staple of food but um so we this is um this not winning for use project is um geared towards um, starting conversations at home with the youth. Um, so we, we have a topic and then we try to encourage the kids to, um, they're offered to um, teachers and educators or village um, youth program coordinators or people like that um, who can provide monthly lessons to uh, kids. And they'll, it's just a broad general topic and then encouraging them, them to go home and talk to their families about it because the family are the real teachers here. Um, so this is just some of it in action at school. Kids are very um, perceptive and they can um, just replay things from, from memory. And so a lot of the things that they draw and do in school, even though they are doodling, you know, they're 
reflections of what they see going on in the village. So like Kachina, um, corn, rain, water, all these things, they're all like flowing through our kids still. And that, that's really great to see they're coming, coming out through their doodles and stuff or their artwork. Our other initiative is the Hopi Seed Initiative, which I'm pretty sure Michael's also passionate about. It's just um, talking about what an heirloom seed is, uh, how it got um, to where it's at, how it got cultivated uh, through thousands of years of um, being drought tolerant, um, protecting those heirloom seeds, as well as um, educating our, our community about um, GMOs and how, you know, we don't want any cross contamination or cross pollination. So encouraging them to use heirloom seeds and not GMO. So we have that initiative going on as well. That's it, just education. Um, we have a Hopi farmer's market, which was uh, an initiative of ours, but um, it took on a life of its own. And so now it's its own, own um, um, project. So it, it's um, made available through different community partners, as you can see at the bottom, uh, different um, people and programs just love this market and they, you know, have, it's taken a life on of its own. So it's not like solely a not one coalition project anymore. It's like a big community project. So um, it got put on hold because of the whole COVID-19 thing. And um, people are just really bummed out that they can't um, go to the markets right now. But um, so that's another initiative. And um, if you like to follow us or um, follow along with any of the content that we have, we're available on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as our website, which is listed below, notwinningcoalition.org. So you'll see a lot of our um, updates there, or if you want to follow, um, sign up for our email um, um, newsletters and stuff like that, you can. So I will pass it on to Michael. Well, thank you very much, Terry. I really, really like what you guys are doing, and uh, we've met before, and so um, I just, you guys just do some great work. And so um, my name is Michael Johnson. I'm from the Hope Village of Kukutsumuvi, um, um, East Wungwuk, a Coyote clan. And I kind of want to share to you a little bit of, of what we do out here from, uh, first of all, what makes our agricultural system so resilient, and then some of the, some of my own personal work that I'm doing with uh, trying to get some of what um, Terry's talking about, trying to reinforce uh, what we have here already. It's just a matter of tweaking it so it works for us rather than us having it work for whoever it needs to, other than it needs to work for. And so let me see if I can do this right and pop my, share my screen. Um, Okay, is everybody able to see that? Yes. Okay. Well, as I said, this is called the Resiliency of Hopi Agricultural Reinforcing Cultural Identity. Um, I think this is probably one of the most important things and one of the things that drive me is that indigenous people protect 80% of global biodiversity on a mere 25% of the planet's land with just less than 5% of the world's population you know, some of this COVID stuff that we're having is a result of the loss of biodiversity. At least that's what some of the leading scientists are saying. So here at Hopi, I think we're probably one of the last bastions of true crop biodiversity in the fact that we still practice what we have. And those seeds that, that uh, Terry's talking about are probably the most, one of the most important things we have as a culture and as a source of identity because there's really no separation between our agricultural system and our ceremonial system and you can see, and you saw that by just looking at the calendar that Terry presented. And so, so these are some of the varieties that I raise uh, up here in my fields. So, you know, I want to talk real quickly about the organization I belong to, the Native American Agricultural Fund. Basically, we're a private rural trust. Uh, we have four funding areas: business assistance, agricultural education, technical support, advocacy services. And our main goal is to support and promote Native American farmers and ranchers continued engagement in agriculture. And some of our grants, we gave around 80 in 2019. This year, our cycle is going to start again. June 1st is the deadline. 
And so if you're interested in that, please apply. Uh, first of all, we, can, we, have, uh, we fund 501c3 organizations, educational organizations, CDFIs, community development funds, initiatives, and tribes, state, federally, and recognized, and all those instrumentalities that go along with that. So what makes Hopi agricultural so resilient? That's a picture of my house in the background back there. People think it's well over 200 years old, but it's only about 15 years old. It hovers above my grandfather's fields. And so that's basically where I'm talking from out there in the middle of nowhere. But to me, it's just home. And so what makes this important is that our agricultural practices have been practiced for well over 2000 years. And they've been tested and they've been adapted to our region, basically their place based. And you can see just by looking at that photograph how dry it is out here and how much of a challenge it is to work and grow crops within our environment with little or no irrigation. We don't have man-made irrigation systems out here. There's one village called in, in Lower Munkopee that does have irrigation, but for the general population out here, we don't have it. In fact, somebody asked me one time, they said, well, why don't you guys irrigate? And then I said, then what would we pray for? <laughs> and so because a lot of our stuff is based upon, you know, our ceremonies and our, and our faith. And so that's one of our leading drivers. So, you know, if you can look at this, we've been practicing these same techniques forever. You know, you can see the photograph dated 1915, 1901. And look at my fields out there, 2015, 2015. So you can see that nothing has really changed over time. You know, I'm of, the, I'm of the school that always talks about if it's not broke, then why fix it, you know? And so what I'm trying to do is enhance what we have out here in order so that some of our younger generation will be able to sustain themselves and have better food security than they do right now. So that we're not so dependent upon running to the grocery store every time something bad happens. Another thing that makes our agricultural system resilient and like Terry pointed out, this is just our way of life. You know, this was an exhibit that, this is from an exhibit that I put on at the Arizona State Museum uh, that's been put on hold from traveling by the Cultural Preservation Office, but um, I'm still working on that one. But, you know, we look at corn as being like our mother. You know, that's, that's, that's well published. We look at it as being our mother. So if we take care of that, you know, it's going to take care of us. And so, so far, you know, we've been able to do that, but we need more people to practice what we're doing out here. And I'll get to that at the end. You know, but I think the most important thing is like Terry said, it's our faith. You know, this picture just came out uh, was from an artist. And if you could look at that, 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 that Kachina right there and look what he's doing and just read the expression of what he's doing there, you can see that that's what farming for us is really about. It's not about economics. You know, when I get into talks, everybody asks me, well, how much money can you make? And for me, that's not the first thing I like to talk about. The first thing I like to talk about is what it does for us, how it, how it evolves our belief system, and how without this, we would not be able to survive in this environment. You know, this is, this is, this is very important to us, you know, and I think, you know, you really have to understand that this is based upon who we are as a people. It's just, it's, it's just the way it is. And so that's the main thing that drives us is our faith. You know, um, a gentleman, Harold Joseph, over in the upper village of Shimopavi told me the story about how we came to be here and stuff like that. But he says that when we came here and met the person that was here, that he said that we need to practice faith. We need to have faith, faith in everything from planting to rain to what we do. And so it's all about faith. So that's what really makes ag healthy agricultural really resilient is our faith. And as long as we continue to have that and practice in our belief systems and continue our ceremonies, our agricultural system will continue for another time in memorial. So now I want to talk about how to try to reinforce that. This is kind of a real cut down version of what I do and based upon my research when I was at the University of Arizona. First of all, we, what is the justification for, for what I'm about to talk about? I want to show you that there's the indigenous agricultural based knowledge, which is IAK and the Natural Resource Conservation Service standards, which is only about 250 years old. And if you want to look at rigor, you can see time tested versus scientific method short term. You know, the panel of experts that I have to use when I do when I do papers, it's this peer review process, it takes almost a year to get something published. Our panel of experts simply are our rituals, our history, and our stories. 
and a lot of that comes from our elders. So they're the experts out here. You know, I, I get I, I hit myself on the head because I'm 53 years old and, you know, I think that I'm an old guy. But when I talk to some of the older people out here, I'm just a kid. <laughs> I'm just a kid in a lot that I do and stuff like that. You know, our process is informal, which is which is which is great. And their process is formal, which is not so great. And this is the most important thing. This is what makes science. This is what science is based upon, replicability. We have over 2,000 years of knowledge, of conservation knowledge and agricultural knowledge, whereas what's going on right now in conventional agriculture is only about 200 years. But yet at the same time, a lot of our techniques are not subsidized like the federal governments are, like the farmers in Iowa. And so why is that? Because they said that we do not, they have not been scientifically proven. My big thing is, oh, yes, they have. They have 2,000 years of replication. We should be able to use some of that money in order to do what we want with it, in order to help us continue on these traditions. And I'll talk about that. So when I'm talking about that, I'm looking at our Hopi agricultural methods. And you can see the side on the, on the left there. That's basically a holistic approach of how we're able to raise things here in this environment. NRCS standard practices have all their things in linear fashion, contour farming. These are all agricultural terms, modern agricultural terms, crosswinds, trap strips, field borders, nutrient management. But what you can see in the middle of is that both of these have the same conservation outcome. And that's important because when you talk about things like soil health, you know, longevity, you know, good for the environment. They have the same outcomes, but ours are true and try tested and they're a lot older than what you see on the right. So let me give you a quick example of that. So this is what they call contour farming, an NRCS standard practice. Basically it allows to, to prevent soil and wind erosion from rain and, and wind from, from messing things off. We've been practicing this for well over 2000 years. And so, but we don't call it contour, we don't call it contour farming. You know, it's just given another name. And for us, it's not so much about proving anything. It's just about adapting to the environment that we're in. See, a lot of our conservation practices and our agricultural techniques, including our crops, are place-based. And so what I'm trying to do is develop this field office technical guide, indigenous field office technical guide, so that different tribes can use different methods and take advantage of this conservation program. So what are the benefits? One of the, one of the things that came in the Farm Bill was this alternative funding arrangements. You know, it's, it's not talked about much, but what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to allow us to, first of all, create our own conservation programs to support things like what Terry's trying to do. You know, it also is gonna provide funds for labor to also provide, you know, what Terry's trying to do with the youth project so that they have some sort of incentive to be out there. You know, it's also going to reinforce our cultural identity by using our own conservation and agricultural techniques. And last but not least, this is the key thing right here. If we're able to use this right, then the other benefits will become health because as you know, a lot of our reservation systems, because of the food that they've been eating for the last 50 or 75 years, have, has created high rates of diabetes and, and everything else like that. You know, it's also going to be used for community engagement, you know. It can be used for land stewardship, which is probably the most important thing because Hopi's, from what I understand and from what, from what I've acknowledged is, is that we are true stewards of the land. And there's, that can be defined different ways, but we're supposed to care for what we have. You know, one example of that is when I was with my grandfather as a young boy, he took me out looking for a certain type of plant and we found it, but then he told me not to pick it. He says, leave it alone because that's gonna be needed for somebody else who's coming on and it's gonna preserve the next generation. You know, so if you think like that, you're able to maintain the environment that you're living in. And so with that, it's kind of quick and kind of short, but this was a picture of, of some of the kids that came to visit me to Head Start, kids from down in one of the villages. And so this is just, I gave them an all an ear of corn. And so that's important to us. And so they look pretty happy there. And so that's basically what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to take what I know and trying to, um, bring it back to the community so that we can reinforce what we already know in, in a good way so that not to make everybody a farmer, but just to have somebody believe in something, something that will sustain them and, and carry them on through things like what we're having right now. And uh, there's, there's, no, there's no, better, no better story than just, you know, having those kids do what, do what, do what they should be doing. Uh, and that's about it, Mary Beth. Hope it wasn't too long. It was kind of short, but 
Hope I gave everybody a chance for some questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for your presentation overview of the work you do. And thank you, Michael. Um, originally, Michael emailed me when I told him about how much time he had. He was like, I thought I had 45 minutes. And so, um, but you did a great job. So thank you for the overview on your work. Um, so now we have time to take questions um, from people. So either you can unmute yourself and ask a question um, or you can um, pop it into the chat box. This is Joan Tamichi um, with the Native Nations Institute. Thank you, Terry and Michael, for participating in this webinar. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Michael what your success has been in um, in being able to convince the greater population, the decision makers, the policy makers, that traditional agricultural um, methods. I forgot what you what what you use what uh, acronym you you utilize, but convince them that that is just as good. You know, you, the, your pay, your presentation was excellent and bringing a point uh, that point across. But how have you been able to get major funders, Department of Ag, and others to be able to um, accept that that we know, you know, indigenous peoples know how to farm, our methods work. Just like to get some sense of how well yeah, you know, that's, to move that forward. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, um, Joanna. Nice to hear your voice again. But you know, I've been, I've been working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and they've been kind of reluctant to let us do these alternative funding arrangements, only in the fact that um, that they're afraid they're going to lose some power. But when I've been talking to the what about I'm also talking to the National Association of Conservation Districts. And also, the I've been talking to the regenerative agricultural folks. And regenerative agriculture is 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 basically, you know, doing what we've been doing for thousands of years. You know, improving soil health, biodiversity, the water cycle. You know, we've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so they're starting to buy into it. Those groups are starting to buy into it. So the more opportunities I have to share, the more the more um, belief. From these people, um, and so they kind of want to jump in too. And so, uh, but I think our, one of our biggest problems is still is trying to go out and tell stories. You know, tell stories about what we're doing and do it in a, like almost like a cultural appropriate fashion. So we're not revealing too much. But um, so I am getting a lot of headway in that, and especially when I'm starting to work with uh, non-native organizations because they have the power to pull it. You know, especially the people that are connected with the supply chain and everything else like that. They're trying to right now buy into trying to figure out how to develop a true sustainability matrix. And so um, I'm working with them also. And so that's about where I'm at on that. You know, I, I know that the Native Nations Institute there is working a lot with this indigenous field knowledge uh, people. And I'm trying to jump into with that too. And, um, but for the most part, people are starting to get into it. It's just that we need to figure out like how we can, you know, get more people involved in, 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 um, in kind of just, let us um, kind of do what the you know use the funds in our own way where we where where we where we feel where it will suit our own needs and not the needs of others. I guess so. I don't know if I answered your question there, but I hope I did. In the chat. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, know, Joan, I, like, I like the thumbs up, Joan. Okay, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, so you have a question is for Michael. Um, Darian Benali, um, do you have any further ideas for areas of research asking as a potential American Indian Studies graduate student? You know, I would like, you know, somebody to start looking at the feasibility study of like, for example, like how many food banks do we have on, on Indian reservations? So when we have these pandemics, we have a backup, kind of like a generator. You know, that's one of the areas I'll think about. And also just looking at the, um, the, the um, vitality of traditional practices, you know, how, how, how they are and, and how things are changing 
as far as you know how people are starting to use regenerative agriculture without looking at what we've been doing. Um, so those are just some of the areas that I kind of would like to suggest. If you would like to, you can email me. I'm sure Mary Beth would have your would have my contact information, and she can give you my email. And we could set up a call, and we could talk more about this at at, at some point. Thanks. I can I'll pop my email into the chat box. So if you do want Michael's information, um, any more questions? Mm -hmm. This is Joan again, Joan Timichi. I had a question um, or a, maybe a recommendation for Terry um, Honani. I, um, I greatly appreciate all the work that you guys are doing out there in the community and with the youth to um, keep our agricultural traditions alive. And um, I was thinking about the pandemic and the impact that it has on Hopi and this, you know, I'm a citizen of Hopi, so um, for me, I look at it very similar to the way that you both do, but just not just for Hopi, but for indigenous peoples um, in general, that many of us have been um, taught to, you know, store, you know, we save our corn, we save our beans, we dry them, we have a, we have, um, we have essentially food to be able to carry us during those lean times. And I'm wondering um, that, I'm not necessarily wondering, but I think that we just take this for granted. This is the way that we live. We don't think, we don't think about it as being something to share with others. And I would encourage Terry with the work that you guys are doing out in the community is to maybe perhaps to begin to document um, how villages, communities, these projects that you're funding what they're, you know, documenting how we do this, because I know that there are tribal communities across the United States and maybe perhaps in the world that are trying to revitalize their agricultural economy. And they're looking to others to find out how, what, have, what has worked for you and how, um, what can we learn from others without having to reinvent the wheel all over again. So, Maybe there are um, little how-to kinds of things, you know, that can be done through some of the short videos such as you did with that other, the one that you showed us. But I would encourage you to move down that route. And for both of you, um, as you produce products, um, papers or either materials, um, we have in the Native Nations Institute has an indigenous governance database that, you know, we would like to be able to link all of this information out there. And for the, everybody else that's out there, if you have information that you, um, that you would like to have a share, um, we're look, generally looking at for information that is um, uh, um, either papers um, that might have been published, research papers, articles. We're also looking at great um, success stories that can be replicated elsewhere. Um, and to talk a little bit about, you know, what the challenge was, um, how you address them, and what the outcomes were, positive and negative, and all in the vein of helping to be more sustainable, having to um, be able to have better control uh, for the direction that we're moving down there. So um, you can connect through Mary Beth. She, um, um, she would be a great person to be able help, to help us filter that through and maybe connect some of these new products. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thanks, Joan. Um, yes, and I did put my email into the chat box, so um, you can connect that way too. Um, what good connections, so this is from Amy Wan, um, for both of you. What good connections and strengths have you seen in indigenous communities for their own collective indigenous food sovereignty? Um, I suppose our, um, our uh, community food assessment has been used and um, um, used as a, you know, to quote from and to um, give data backing to a lot of organizations out here. So um, I know Hopi Tutsula Permacultural Institute, the Hopi Food Co-op, um, and different smaller um, agri cultural programs out here have have used that works so we're doing another one we just got granted from first nations development institute uh their gather grant so we're going to redo the um, hopi food community assessment so this will give us 
new and fresh data to compare to the one that was done in 2004. So um, I think the um, to do the food sovereignty, um, you know, we need data to go off of, and then it can formulate your own your own programs and and how, depending on your capacity, how you're going to address those problems that you see come out of the or or strengths and weaknesses that come out of um, you know um, studies like that. Then you can start doing your own developing your own programs to address the issues that you see are most important to you. So um, I think when we redo our, our food uh, assessment, it'll give everybody a, a better idea of what's going on currently on Hopi with our food issues. Yeah, I, well, real, real quickly, as far as the collectivity that you're talking about, Amy, you know, there's there's been some good stuff out there. You know, there's Ramona Farms down there in uh, southern Arizona, which pr produces both conventional crops and um, in, uh, indigenous crops and temporary beans. Uh, and they're basically using their, their um, conventional practices to support that, that, that indi those indigenous crops, which is a good thing. You know, there's also Quapaw in Oklahoma, the Quapaw tribe, which has the, ha which is, has the only Native American, um, um, uh, not food processing, but I guess it would be slaughter facility on the reservation. And that also caters to non-Indians too, but th that kind of regionally based approach is very beneficial in the fact that it gets us out of this bottleneck that we're experiencing right now. Unfortunately, what's happening right now is that we have too much stuff in one, and too many eggs in one basket. And so things are getting clogged up. So my approach is to try to try to bring some of these crops, maybe not to sell right away, but try to establish something on, on reservations where the people who are actually raising the product are getting the biggest bang for the buck, rather than people like Walmart who finally get, who finally get to sell it for whatever they're gonna, for 10 times as much of what it, was what it costs for us to raise. And so that's how come, those are some of the examples that I have um, right now. Great, thank you. Um, Corey had a question. How do you feel about water rights and do major commercial farmers use up the water? <laughs> um, you know, water rights is a, is, a, is a, go ahead, Terry, go ahead, Terry. Uh, there's a lot of water issues out here. It's, it's, a, it's a, a precious, precious resource that's constantly being depleted. So we have um, underground water reservoirs that were um, pristine, you know, perfect water sources that got used up during um, the coal mine, through the coal mine. Um, so they had Peabody coal mine that um, used our precious aquifer water to pump and slurry coal out to the Navajo generating station to um, power um, the power plants that go out to different um, major cities. And so they depleted an entire aquifer. Um, then we have the different um, Little Colorado River and the Colorado River itself where people are still trying to tap into it. So there are different organizations out there and um, people on the front lines that are constantly, continuously trying to um, protect our our water resources that um, have, you know, are basically the veins of our whole um, water system out here. So um, there's people constantly trying to um, tap into our water supplies that feed a lot of, not just Hopis, but Navajos, Wallapais, uh, the different tribes that are out here in Arizona. So um, we just, you know, there's, it's always a constant, um, natural resource that's always trying to get tapped into and we have like people on the front lines trying to advocate for it so um it's not so much commercial farmers it's more of um industrial corporations who try to use it for their own gain so um not so much commercial farmers i don't see go ahead michael <laughs> i mean water rights you know Water rights under the winner's doctrine, you know, we're supposed to be indigenous people, at least in the West, are supposed to ha have first rights to all that. But, you know, through conscious litigation, it seems like we have less and less rights. There's about, I think, about three or four tribes now in Arizona that haven't settled those rights. You know, recently there was act from an act, a senator from um, Arizona at their, at their local level was saying that if we don't settle these 
water rights that that um, that that they're not gonna they're not gonna um, give us these casino extensions and all that bull crap. You know, it's kind of trying to hold us hostage. But that got thrown out the door. You know, uh, as far as commercial farmers are concerned, they do use a lot of water. Um, that's just the way it is. But with this new negotiation that's coming out uh, in Arizona, at least they they'll have the last they'll be the last ones to have their rights. So a lot of their rights will be taken away due to the population. And so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, for your information, the tribes down here, at least in Southern Arizona, hold 50% of what comes out of the California Aqueduct Project. And so they don't even use all their water. And so uh, I always encourage them to water bank as much as they can and then see how the state and everybody reacts to that. Because we do have that much uh, entitlement to what we do. We just don't um, enforce it enough. And um, so, and, and, and right. one of our biggest thing up here is just, you know, trying to find a new water source to, to go into some of our villages because a lot of our water is, is high in arsenic and it, and it tends to get people sick. And so nobody wants to drink that, right? And so, uh, but yet the federal government, again, is dragging their heels about being responsible and living up to their trust responsibility to, to, to provide what they promised us and, um, and, to pro and, and through contracts. And so I can go into that, but I won't because <laughs> that can get me into some trouble. But, you know, I just think that, you know, Native people do have first and foremost water rights above all else. And so that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. So going along with that question, Cynthia asked, how are you both factoring um, climate changes regarding traditional growing um, techniques along with extensive use of groundwater pumping, which um, Terry mentioned by the Peabody Coal Company, and what efforts or strategies of resilience are you implementing as you increase your capacity of food sovereignty and maintaining the balance between traditional and contemporary Hopi Tewa way of life? I, um, with climate change, um, I, we purposely put ourselves here. Um, out here on Hopi Tutskwa at our, at our center of the universe. So, um, you know, historically we chose this shortest ear of corn. We've um, migrated to this particular place um, that we refer to as the center of the universe. And, you know, we had to adapt with those changes of climates and whether it was a good rainfall year or whether it's a, a drought year, we still, maintain our our traditional um Hopi dryland farming techniques so um I don't um it doesn't affect our traditional growing we like Michael said our we we plant and grow by faith and by prayer so um you know we just take the weather and climate change as 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 we can and keep keep planting um, so, um, the pumping from Peabody Coal, um, um, or sorry, what's the question? So it's what effects, um, what efforts or strategies of resilience are you implementing as you increase your capacity of food sovereignty and maintaining the balance between traditional and contemporary Hopi and Tewa way of life? I believe our traditional, um, system just it stays historically traditional. It, it it stays in the hands of our um, of our people and of our um, of our um, uh, the chiefs and clans and different um, and the different societies that are out here. Because it's like it's so massive. Like it, to explain how our culture is out here. Um, so traditional stays you know, traditional, but contemporary way. Now our children are being, um, are being encouraged to go off and get education like how I did and then bring that education back and then to, to basically have the, the mindset and um, mentality to fight for our people when it comes to um, contemporary issues like water issues, um, land issues so that we can fight you know head to head with our traditional knowledge and our and our um you know our um western knowledge so we can be heavy hitters when it comes to protecting our own resources and continuing our way of life so 
um, even though we're encouraged to go off, we're encouraged to come back once we're done with our education. That way we can continue our way of life. So I see like our, our traditional and contemporary way of life. Like if you um, balance the two, you're, you're, you're a formidable opponent to, you know, to protect your people and preserve your way of life. Go ahead, Michael. You know, as, as far as climate change, I always get to ask that question. Well, what are the Hopis do with, with climate change? And my thing is that we've always done something with climate change, just like Perry explained. We've always adapted to something that's happened, whether it be, you know, spacing our plants further apart, you know, planning early, planning later. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know, at least that I know out here, do not know what climate change is because it hasn't been explained to them properly. You know, to us, it's just another cycle. You know, traditionally, we're supposed to raise enough to last us three to five years to overcome these episodes. The problem that I see right now is that there's just not enough people out there to keep that supply going. Um, and when that happens, we start to lose things like some of our seed varieties or corn varieties and everything else. And so once we lose those, we lose those for good. We'll never get that back. And so a, a lot of what, what Terry's organization is doing, I commend her for that, is trying to get more of the youth involved. A lot of their programs are, are, are our agricultural programs and try to increase that overall capacity, that overall supply of what's going on out there. Because Hopi's, you know, we raise, we, we have like 42 dishes that involve corn, you know, and, and if we don't have the corn and we're not planning enough for that, we can't have those dishes, you know? And so we need to keep to do that. And Terry's right, it is, this, this is the life we chose. We chose to live in this region here, you know? And so we need to, we need to reinforce what we were, what we had a long time ago. And so what I'm trying to do is from the technical side and from the wide, wide perspective is to bring attention to what we, what we need out here so that their organizations, their grassroots organizations can get a hold of that and run with that, you know? And so, you know, I don't want to ever have to make picky bread from blue corn meal that I bought in Iowa. You know, I don't, I don't make picky bread personally, but a lot of the ladies do, and they're always complaining about trying to, you know, they don't have enough. There's not, men aren't out, out there enough farming for them and doing things that men are supposed to be doing out here, which they should be doing, but they're not. And so, you know, I just don't want to buy blue, blue corn meal from Iowa. You know, especially when I could raise it in my backyard. So trying to get that capacity up and even dealing with climate change, you know, is very important. But for me, climate change is, is a cycle, you know, and I, I'm not going to, and I'm a scientist, maybe I shouldn't say that, but it's a cycle. And it has been proven that what we're doing is harming that. But, you know, we've had 200 year droughts out here, but yet we survive because we use our own techniques and we use our own faith. That's the most important thing. Thank you um, for both of you. So we're at time. So just wanting to make sure that um, we respect everybody's time because I know we're all busy. Um, a big miigwech to both Terry and Michael for your sharing your stories, the work you do, what you do for your people. Got some corn. Michael would probably be passing out corn at this point um, in general. And also thank you um, to all of you who joined and for your questions. And um, I do wanna add uh, that we were gonna have the meeting, as I mentioned earlier at Hopi, and we were not, we obviously got suspended, but before it got suspended, um, Terry was actually a great asset in helping start to figure out logistics and what was gonna happen. And also Monica, who's the executive director at Hopi Foundation. Um, she was also somebody who was great in um, assisting and planning and ideas around that. And they were going to host, Hopi Foundation was going to host a meeting. So I do want to thank them, um, hopefully at another date, another time when everybody and things are healthier, that we could all be there together again, uh, have a network meeting there. So thank you all. Um, we'll probably have another webinar in um, June, possibly. So just continue to look. Uh, I mentioned this will be uploaded into our um, IFCAN Indigenous Foods Knowledges Network website. And I put the website into the um, chat box. And as Joan Tamichi, she's uh, one of my bosses at Native Nations Institute. If you have anything you want to share in NNI's Indigenous Governance Database, um, please send it my way. I also had to put my email into the chat box. Um, but thank you all. And I hope you're all your families your communities are staying safe and best can during these times. So um, best wishes to you all. Thank you thank for you, listening. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry.